Good evening to each of you. Thank you so much for joining us here at our Bible study again. We will we're looking again at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and we will end this chapter tonight with the last pericope. Thank you so much for joining us. 1 John in the New Testament chapter 5. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity, Father God. Another pr a chance, Father God, to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, to lift you, to magnify you, Lord. We thank you, God, for all that you do, all who you are. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us again. Now, Lord, we come to approach your word. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you in a mighty way. Bless us that we will see you, hear from you, and bless us that tonight your word will teach us in a way like never before. We ask you, Father God, that the words from the page will jump from the page and make a difference in our lives. And Lord, we ask you to bless us to run and tell others about the goodness of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you again for joining us tonight for our Bible study. Tonight we're in 1 John chapter 5. We will end tonight, the chapter 5 tonight, with verses 18 through 21. 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Uh, the Apostle John has been walking us through what we ought to have as believers, what we ought to know that we have as believers. One of the things that we have as believers is the assurance that Jesus Christ is the right way. The other thing we have is that we are confident in the fact that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord. He's the Son of God. So John walks throughout this chapter in chapter five, giving us certainty, certainty that we are who God has said we are. The problem is we don't know who we are in Christ Jesus. And as we realize, as we go forth and go and understand who we are in Christ Jesus, we will know for certainly we need to be a witness for him. We need to call men to Christ through Jesus Christ, and we need to call them through sal to salvation through him. He informs us throughout this chapter that we need to make sure that we have compassion in our prayers. On last week, we ended up, up talking about the fact that we must have compassion in our prayers. That famous verse is there that tells us that we can have whatever we need if we just pray about it. I advised you last week and I would advise you again tonight. Do not take this verse out of context. Do not take this verse out of content. Make sure the verse stays within the story in which it's written. Look at what he says. Let's look at verse 14 through 16 through 17. Rather, it's where we ended up last week. We just want to set the stage again tonight. <clears throat> verse 14 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we ask of him. Many, even preachers, even apostles, even bishops have taken this verse out of context and out of context. See, the fact of the matter is tonight when we read 1 John chapter 5, the apostle John is speaking to believers and he's talking to believers about their testimony in Christ Jesus. He's saying to believers that we have this testimony. And the testimony is that God has given us eternal life. And he has given us this eternal life so we can walk therein. He has given us this eternal life and we have received this eternal life through Jesus Christ, the son of God. In other words, there's no one, no being other than Jesus Christ who can usher us into eternal life. So he says to us that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And on last week, he started talking about the fact we talked about that. He mentioned the fact that we ought to make sure that we call men to salvation and call men to accountability through Jesus Christ. That's why he says in verse 14, 
if we know, if we pray with confidence, then we can have whatever we ask. What he's saying is, if we pray with confidence for lost souls, if we pray with confidence for those who are running away from God, if we pray with confidence for those who are in sin, then God will grant us what we, our request is. We are praying for stuff. He's asking us to pray for believers who are in sin. He's asking us to pray for believers who are doing the wrong things. He's even asking us to pray for those who would to be saved. Let me, let me verify that for you right now. In verse 15, 1 John chapter 5, verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know, we know, we understand, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. The content here is salvation. The content here is sanctification. It's not about our stuff. Verse 16, if anyone sees a brother sinning, look at it. It's talking about sin. It's talking about sanctification. It's talking about deliverance from sin. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother, if anyone sees a believer, if anyone observe someone in sin who say that they love the Lord, anyone observe someone in sin, a brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. If they don't die in their sin, we ought to continue to pray for them. We ought to call on God. We ought to let God know that this person is in sin as if God doesn't know. We ought to tell God. We ought to call God. We ought to go to God and say, look, God, this person is in sin. He did not say Twitter it or tweet it. He did not say email it. He did not say Facebook it. He says, if you have a brother in sin, talk to God about it. Talk to God. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians that if we find a brother in sin, we who are strong, go to that brother and lift him. Go to that brother and encourage him. Bear him up. So he says in verse 16, if anyone sees a brother in sinning a sin that does not lead to death. He, who will, you and I will, you and I will ask and he will give him life. Give who life? Give the person in sin life. For those who commit sin not leading to death. God wants to give everyone, everyone's life. I said to you before, it is our responsibility to make God's dream come true. Now, let me make sure I unpack this well. God doesn't need us to make his dreams come true, but it sure is good when God can use us to deliver somebody from sin. And to God be the glory. If you are ministering to someone, if you're speaking to someone, if you're praying toward God about someone and that person walks away from sin to God be the glory. So this is not a passage that you can pray for your stuff. Yes, the fervent prayers of a righteous man, woman, boy, girl availeth much. So if these perfect prayers, this prayers of the righteous in order for it to avail much, First of all, we must be in the will of God. And it is God's will that no man, no woman, no child get caught in sin or live in sin. We'll get to that with today's lesson. So he goes on, goes on to say, there is sin that leads to death. This death is both physically and spiritually death. It is spiritual death and it is physical death. Adam 
had life. He walked the garden. He walked with God. God would walk through the garden in the cool of the day. He would have a conversation with Adam, have a conversation with Eve. And they had a intimate, wholesome relationship. But when sin entered, once sin took place, once sin entered the equation, God and Adam had a great gulf placed between them. That gulf was sin. Adam couldn't get to God. God couldn't get to Adam. There was a great gulf that sin, that sin that separated them from fellowship. They no longer had wholesome fellowship. They no, no longer walked together and talked together as they had because of sin. And it's at that time that death entered the scene. There was spiritual death and physical death. Ever since then, man been dying. <laughs> Ever since then, man's eyes have been spiritually closed because sin has entered into the world and sin will always separate us from God. Believers break fellowship when sin comes on the scene. And I'm not talking about big black sin. I'm talking about little white sin. I'm talking about little black sin, little brown sin, little purple sin, little blue sin. Sin separates us from God. See, we have gotten to a point where we, we think that everything that's big, black, and ugly is the sins that God is concerned about. The fact of the matter is, sin has separated us from our brothers and sisters, and sin separates us from our holy God. It's because of sin. So when we look at the text, the text goes on to say that, in, that what we need to know in verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. Not what we measure out to be sin, but all unrighteousness. And unrighteousness is anything that goes against the will of God. If it goes against the will of God, then it's sin. If God doesn't approve of it, then it's sin. And let me tell you, when you know that you're caught in sin, or you're about to sin, or you're dealing with sin, or you're dabbling with sin, is when you have to look over your shoulder to see if anybody's looking. If you have to stop for a moment and wonder if this sin going to separate you from God. Whenever you have to question whether it's right or wrong, then it's sin. Uh, people use certain words and sometimes, depending on how close to them I am, I would remind them that that's a cuss word. And they will say, well, that's in the Bible. Well, if you cannot stand at the altar in church, say it out loud with a, a plain and simple good conscience, then it's sin. And if you have gotten to a point as a believer where you can say anything, do anything, act any kind of way, you have to be careful because sin has entered in and sin has influenced you and you're on a Satan's influence. Verse 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin. There is sin not leading to death. In other words, there is sin that does not lead you to physically die. But it's still sin. But believe this, the next few verses, the next pericope will let us know that even when we don't physically die, we are spiritually dying. Verse 18, this last pericope in 1 John chapter 5 leads off with three, three repetitions. The same two words over and over again, three times. We know in verse 18. We know in verse 19. We know in verse 20. Let's see what we know. Verse 18 says, we know whosoever is born of God does not sin. Uh, uh. Whosoever born of God does not sin, but 
he who has been born of God keeps himself in the one does not touch him. Ooh, that's a lot to unpack there. We know. He says we know. This word know means we see, we understand. We see it with our sanctified imagination. Matter of fact, this word know in the original Greek is imagination. It, it, it says to us that we see it with our imagination. It says to us that we see it with our spiritual eyes. It says to us that we even see it to the point where we understand. So it says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now you and I both know, you and I all know that even though we're saved, we still sin. We know even though we say we cut our eyes and think some stuff. We understand that even though we're saved, we say some things that are ungodly. We know that even though we're saved, we, we act a way that is ungodly. The text declares, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Let me just say to you today, that when the author, the apostle John, says the person that's not born of God, does, the person who is born of God does not sin, this phrase or this sentence is saying to us, he doesn't labor in sin. He or she doesn't live in sin. This, this person does not have a habit of sinning. It's not habitual for him, I mean, or for her. It's, it's not a practice of sin. We all sin. We all fall short. We all miss the mark. But in the midst of it, we need to understand that we can run back to God. One thing about David, David messed up several times with God, but he knew where to run. He ran back to God. He knew to whom to run. He ran back to God. Lord, here I am again. Look at Psalm number 51 where David lays it all on the altar. David says, he says, Lord, restore to me the, the right relationship I once had with you. Restore the joy of my salvation. Cleanse me with hyssop. Make me, renew me over and over again. He says, God, I messed up again. And let me tell you, you're going to mess up. Doesn't matter how old you are and how long you've been walking this walk. You're going to do some things that are sin. So the text declares when you are living habitually in sin, you got to question yourself and your salvation. For he says that whosoever is of God, whosoever is a Christian, whosoever is born of God, does not labor, does not practice, does not make it a habit of sinning. But he who has been born of God keeps himself. This word keeps means that you set forth a God around yourself. You, 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 can't, you can't participate in certain things. It means you set a God. You set up a standard. The Bible teaches that when the devil comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. You can look at that two ways. When, when the devil comes in and the devil is coming in like a flood, God raises up a standard. Or you can look at it this way. When the devil comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. Because God is raising up a standard, we have to raise up a standard. This word keeps means that we are on God. We, we keep ourselves. We're on God for ourselves. It is the idea of a military fortress, a military force that surrounds us. And we have to surround our minds and our hearts. We have to keep ourselves. We live in the land of the free, the home of the braves. We could not be the land of the free in the home of the braves if there was not military forces 
a fortress that has been set up around us in the air, in the sky, on the sea, on land, army, air force, coast guard, marines. All, all these have been set up as a military fortress around us. They are forces around us that keeps us protected. The text declares that, that the person who's born of God keeps himself like a military force. He keeps himself. He keeps, she keeps herself. There's a God. You're always on God. You're always waiting to see what God has to say. And you have a standard that has been set. The problem is many Christians don't have much standard. There ought to be some times that people accuse you of something. Your friends ought to be able to say, no, that's not him. No, that's not her. I'm so glad that somebody can say about you when money is missing. No, you didn't. That person wouldn't do that. When somebody was cussing like a seaport sailor. Oh, no, you got the wrong person. When somebody got caught stealing. Oh, no, that's not the person that would do that. Because they understand that you have set up a standard. And your God is up in such a way that there's a shield about you. So the, the believer, the believer, he says, we know that whosoever is born of God does not sin habitually. <laughs> but this person that is born of God keeps himself. Let me tell you what else he says right here in the text. And the wicked, the wicked one does not touch him. Here we go again. You know, Satan is like a roaring lion. He's running to and fro trying to see who he can devour. Even though believers pray with confidence, even though believer, believers are praying for others and praying for their church members, praying for other believers, it says you put a guard around you. And once you put that guard around you, you keep yourself. Once you keep yourself, the wicked one does not touch you. He can't touch your soul. The wicked one cannot cannot uh, influence your soul, but he can influence you. That's why that's why we find ourselves every day wrestling. The Apostle Paul says in, in Romans chapter seven that that every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. I have a law in my mind, in my heart that leads me before God. But I see another law in my members. That every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. It is bringing me into captivity, Paul says in Romans chapter 7. If things get so bad with sin when it comes to Paul in Romans chapter 7, he says in Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, this word, O beat up man that I am, O burdened man that I am, who is going to deliver me from this sinful death? Every time I try to do right, I go wrong. Every time I would to do good, I go wrong. Every time I try to live a holy life, I sin. Who shall deliver me? Romans chapter 7, verse 24, asks this question. Then there come Romans chapter 7, verse 25. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. He will deliver me from this awful sin, this awful death. God keeps us through Jesus Christ. We have to set a guard around ourselves, but we cannot do it without Jesus Christ. We have to trust Jesus. We have to walk in him. He says the wicked one does not touch you. He can't touch your soul. He cannot dwell within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you, but he can influence you. He says the wicked one cannot touch you. He says in verse number 18, 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, he says a bunch of things in that little short verse. He says, we know, we understand. We have the influence to know. We have the ability to know. We have the Holy Spirit in us and we know. What do we know? Whosoever is born of God does not sin on a habitual level does not sin as a practice, does not live in sin continually. When sin has its place in you, you get out of that thing. When sin shows up, and let me just share with you, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, sin is going to show up. 
You may not like the party, but sin's going to show up. You may not drink, but sin is going to show up. And when the devil, the wicked one shows up, he doesn't show up with ugly stuff that doesn't attract you. He knows everything you love. He knows every tidbit. He knows what you like. He knows what turns you on. He knows what gets your attention. And when the wicked one, when the devil himself, when Satan shows up, he's going to present it on a silver platter or a gold platter. Some things you won't give in to, but the devil knows what you like. And the devil knows even though we're saved, we still have this sin nature running around. This sin nature and this sin nature, regardless of how holy you are, you see, that's where the church misses it. The church misses it because we have come to the conclusion that I'm holy, I'm sanctified, I'm going to heaven anyway. You're right. But you have to live on planet Earth. And as you live on planet Earth, the wicked one comes to kill, steal and destroy. He has come, especially for the saints, and he has come for the saints to influence them. He doesn't live in you. He doesn't have a part of your life, but he influences your life. But the text declares that you ought to put up a guard. Put up a shield, hold up a standard. Young people got to have a standard. Seniors have to have a standard. Young adults have to have a standard. You have to have a standard, something that you're going to hold on to regardless of what goes on around you. There ought to be something that somebody can say about you. No, he didn't do that. She didn't do that. Verse number 19. We know that we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He says, and that's New King James Version, and you will see some, 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 uh, some identifying areas in here that means that it may not have been in the original text, uh, uh, italicis in your writing. But he says, we know that we are of God. And the whole world is under the wicked one, or under the sway of the wicked one, under the influence of the wicked one. He says, we know that the wicked one has this system of things. He has this system of things going on and he has those who are not saved. And those who are not saved, not only are they influenced by the devil, they live with the devil. They act out. The devil say jump, they jump. The devil say walk, they walk. The devil say be rebellious, they, they are rebellious. The, the apostles knew. And as the text is talking, the apostles knew that they were different. Let me say to you tonight, dear, you are different. Brother, you are different. Sister, you are different. You are saved. You are filled with this precious Holy Ghost. Don't let the devil influence you. Don't let the devil have his way with you because he already has the world. Satan does not touch the one that's born of God, but he has the whole world in his grips. He has the whole world under his dominion. Don't you allow the devil to influence you as he already has the, old, the whole world in his grips. Don't, don't let him influence you. He has unbelievers in his grips. He has dominion over them. But when we got saved, we got saved from three things. Number one, we got saved from the penalty of sin. We don't have to die in shame. We don't have to die and go to hell. Number two, we, we died from the penalty of sin from the power of sin. That's what he's talking about when he says he has dominion over the world. He has dominion over the world, but not power or dominion over us. And thirdly, we got saved from the very presence of sin. And this presence, this absence of sin, the, saved from the very presence of sin, once we die, we go to heaven, we have glorified body, there's no sin in heaven. There's none. 
So we got saved from the, the penalty of sin. We don't have to go to hell. The penalty is death. We don't have to die and go to hell. We got saved from the power of sin. The devil has no dominion over us. He has no control. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches that, that when we sin, we are led away by our own fleshly desires. That's that sin nature in us. We like sin. Matter of fact, let me just tell you, let me drop this on you. We love sin. We get joy out of sin because that's the sin nature in us. You can tell that people get joy out of sin when they start talking about, oh man, that was a good old days. And they're not talking about church either. That was a good old days, man. That was a good old days, man. We, we do this. We do this. They're not talking about churching being the good old days. They're talking about when they did their own thing, their own way, when they, they were led by Satan. Satan has the whole world, the whole cosmos, the whole atmosphere, the system. He's the prince of this world. He leads men into evilness. Satan has the world in his grips. He has the world under his dominion. Verse 20. Here's the third. And we know. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. We know it. There's no doubt. John is just summarizing chapter five all over again. He says there's no doubt in our mind. We don't have to get in a discussion. We don't have to get into the debate. We know that the son of God, Jesus Christ himself, has already come. He's already landed in Bethlehem of Judea. He has already come. He has always already come to this world. He has already been here. And we have to understand that he has shown up in order to be saved. You got to understand that Jesus has shown up. He was really born of a virgin called Mary. Let's look at verse number 20. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Not only has he come. He's given us understanding. What understanding? That we may know him who is true. <laughs> Jesus Christ has come. He's given us understanding. And he wants us to understand through our imagination. He wants us to understand through, through our wisdom. He wants us to understand for true. He wants us to understand that he has come and that we know him who is true. We know Jesus. This word know is, is to have an intimate relationship with him. Do you have an intimate relationship with him? We understand and we know him and we know who is true. He is true. Jesus Christ is true. The word true in the original Greek means truth. Not only is he true, he is the truth. It says to his disciples, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. I am the life. I am the light. I am true. And I am the one who is true. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. He's talking to us and telling and reminding us, just as I said in the previous verses, he's reminding us that we're in him. He's reminding us that he's in us. And as Jesus Christ is in us and we are in him, the devil may influence us, but he can't live in us. He can, he can influence us in such a way to other men who are watching will wonder, man, are they really saved? When, when they see you and, and, and you're acting ungodly, people begin to wonder, are you really born again? Are you really saved? I love telling the story about the woman that was sitting at the red light. And when she was sitting at the red light, there was a car in front of her. And you know how it is in Houston and probably all over the world now. When, when, the, when the light is on red, people wander off and start doing other things in their cars. 
So this person was sitting at the red light. The second car was the woman that was blowing and beating on her horn and, and trying to get the person to move. All of a sudden, the police pulls that second person over. He says that I, I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm stopping you because I know this car is stolen. No, this is my car. See, I have the identification. I have the registration. This is my car. He said, no, I know this car is stolen. Because on the back of your bumper, you have a fish indicating that you love the Lord. You have Jesus on, the, on your windshield, Jesus on your rear, rear bumper. You have Jesus on your side window. I know this car is stolen. You got Jesus plastered all around this car and you have a bumper sticker on the back with a slogan on it that talks about Jesus. I realize I know that this is a stolen car. Will you please step out the car? She, he said, he says, officer, she said, officer, this is my car. He said, well, the reason why I know there's a stolen car is because the way you were acting back there is not the way Christians act. The way you were going off and throwing the bird and, and slamming on the, on the dashboard and riding on your horn, this is not how Christians react. I know this car is stolen. It's a wake up call for that lady. I'm saying to you today, we know him. And we are in him and he is true. And because we are in him and he's true in his son, Jesus, we know him intimately. And because we know him intimately and he's in us, he is true. We are in him and he's in us. And we ought to act like he's in us. God, the Holy Spirit walks with us. He, he, he's in us. He ought to be the influence in us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He ought to be the influence in us. He says, we are in him who is true, and in his Son, Jesus Christ. We are in God. God is true. We are in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Watch it here. I know I can get some, some, some contesting here, but he says, this is the true God eternal life. He says the son, his son, the son of God, the son, Jesus Christ in his son. He is the true God, his son, the Jesus Christ, the one who is the truth, the one who is true. He is the true God and he is eternal life. Jesus Christ is a true God. Jesus Christ is eternal life. We can't have eternal life without Jesus Christ. He, the text declares that we're in his son, God's son. Who is his son? Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is the true God. Jesus is eternal life. There is none like him. He is God's only begotten, only begotten son only unique son, only one of a kind son. Jesus is Jesus the Christ. Verse 21. He closes by giving his closing argument. He closes by giving a closing command. He closes by saying to the little children, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Remember now, when John begins talking to little children, he's talking about the new converts. He's talking about people in the Lord. He appropriately closes this, per per this pericope as well as this chapter out by reminding them that it is appropriate. It is appropriate for you to stay away from false gods. It is appropriate for you to stay away from false ideas. It is appropriate for you to stay away from idols. He even talks about, and the text brings it out, bears it out, stay away from food sacrificed to idols. Stay away from false doctrine. You know, unfortunately, in the 20th and the 21st century, a lot of new stuff has come out. And people flock to it. 
I mean, Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection is not enough for us to be saved now, according to them. You got to have all these other stuff. The reason why people don't believe that all it takes is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for your salvation is because they're looking for something new. They think it's so simple, it's too simple. They believe that they got to do some extraordinary things to be saved. They believe that treating folk right and being missionaries will save them. I'm saying to you today, the text declares that Jesus Christ is true. God the Father is true. God the Holy Spirit is true. He says, this is the true God. Jesus Christ is the true God. And this is the true God and he's eternal life. It's in Jesus and Jesus alone. There may be somebody listening to me today who have not come to the conclusion before this message that salvation, eternal life, everlasting life is in Jesus and Jesus alone. I know celebrities have told you that you can get to heaven other ways, that they've told you that eternal life is through other means. But I'm telling you today, the text declares, the Bible says, Jesus says, John the apostle says that the only way to get to Christ is through Jesus. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to get to know Jesus. Trust him today. Believe him today. Accept him today. His name is Jesus, the son of the almighty God. Yes, if you want to talk about how good God is and you're not saved, you haven't seen anything yet. The senior saints would say like this. It gets sweeter and sweeter, wrong by wrong. It gets sweeter and sweeter, round by round. It gets sweeter and sweeter, day by day. Just a little talk with Jesus will make it all right. The talk that you need to have with him tonight is invite him into your life. Trust him as your savior. Believing the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and he died for me. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. He died between two thieves. He died because mean men killed him. They laid Jesus in a borrowed tomb. It was borrowed because he didn't need it too long because early that third day morning, he rose with all power from the dead. If you can just believe this story tonight, if you can trust this story, not even being there, not seeing it on your own, if you can trust this story, that this story and this story alone can get you to heaven, can give you eternal life, you can be saved right here, right now in your living room, in your car. You can be saved right here, right now. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Repeat these words, these simple words after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus name. Amen. We believe as you pray this simple prayer that you are now born again, that when you die, you are on your way to heaven. We believe that you can walk these shores, these streets, you can live on planet earth, and you don't have to be under the power of sin. You are born again now. We believe that the Holy Spirit is in you and he makes a way out of no way. We believe that Jesus Christ will welcome you to heaven. There may be others of you who struggle with, with sin, like everyone who's listening to me, like my, myself. We believe that Jesus Christ can fix it. We believe if you turn it over to him, you, we know that we don't have to be one who practice sin, but God can deliver us. Let us pray. Father God, we come now praying for each of us. We pray that you bless us. Keep us, Lord. Bless us that we don't give in to sin, that the devil won't have his way, that we would not be influenced by the evil one. 
Bless us, Father God, that the wicked one won't disturb our peace and lead us back to, to him. We pray, Father God, for every person who suffers in and out of the world and the world system. We pray, Father God, that you bless us. Give us a better way, Father God, for we know that Jesus is the best way. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Let me just say to you, if you're not in a church, a good Bible teaching church, and you're in between churches, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Inbox us and let us know that you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church. We will welcome you with open arms. And those of you who have received Jesus Christ tonight, we praise God for you. Let us know that, that you received him and you're on your way to heaven. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit walks with you. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. We want to give to the Lord. We want to bless him as he is blessing us. Father God, we come now with this moment of giving. We ask you to bless every giver. Bless our hearts that we would give not grudgingly, nor out of necessity. For God, we know you love a, true, uh, a cheerful giver. We ask you to bless us as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. You can give by two means. Number one, you can give by mailing your offering in or your gifts in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can make your contribution by way of Zale. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That's lifting, period, Jesus at yahoo.com. We'll be glad to hear from you. We're looking forward to, to you visiting with us, looking forward to you joining us in service. Our service is on Sunday at 1030 a.m. Prior to 1030 service, we have 9 o'clock Sunday school. And every Wednesday night at 7.15, we'll be right here, right back on this station and in person. We'll be 7.30 on Wednesday, 7.15 rather, on Wednesday for Bible study. Again, thank you for joining us. We're lifting our church in prayer. We're lifting every member in prayer. We're lifting up Joe Brown Lee and Audrey Brown Lee. We're lifting them before the Lord and so many others who are ailing and and going through this process. I said on Sunday that we can't avoid the process. Sooner or later, rain will fall on the just as well as the unjust. So you can't avoid the process. Just relax in the process and trust God through the process. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let's pray for one another. Let's continue to pray for the Brownlee family. We're gonna to continue to pray for those who are sick and bereaved. We thank you so much for being a part. Father God, we thank you now. We honor your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for this service. Lord, we ask you to bless us to know. Bless us to know always who we are in Jesus Christ. Bless us to know that if we're born of God, we, are, we need to keep ourselves on God. Keep us focused and keep us in your will. Lord, bless us, Father God, that we won't fall prey to the evil one to Satan, to Lucifer, the devil himself. And bless us, Lord, that we will have understanding. We will operate in wit wisdom. We will exercise in our minds, our feelings, and our desires what you would have us to do. Lord, we ask you to keep our church. Bless us as we represent you well. Keep every member, bless every child that's going back to school or going back to school. We ask you to give them safe passage. We pray, Father God, to give them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Keep them focused, Father God, and keep them in your will. Now, Lord, somebody, somebody's been leaving you tonight for something hard. I ask you to deliver it to them. Bless them through it. Bless them and encourage them that you hear them. As they pray, Father God, I ask you to give them what they've asked. And, Lord, there's somebody who's unsaved. I ask you to save souls. 
Bless them, Father God, to surrender unto you that life will be made the better. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say amen and amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. Thank you. Be blessed.